I couldn't agree with uh, Jim more. I think, I think God has brought you here, brought me here, brought us here for a reason. And it is a privilege this morning to welcome you all here. Um, it is a privilege as well to welcome our, our Kesslinger campus and our South Street campus who are joining us via, via simulcast as we celebrate together one year of ministry as a neighborhood church here in Mill Creek. And as I've had opportunity just, just over this week and, and beyond to reflect over the last year and all that's taken place over these months together, there's a, there's a couple of, of just thoughts that, that continue to emerge for me. The first is just the, the reality and the experience of God's faithfulness and this, this whole process. Throughout this entire story that's been written, one thing has been consistently evident to me, and that is that the neighborhood church vision is not about us. It's not about expanding the, the Chapel Street name. It's, it's not about growing more buildings. It's, it's about God's call in our hearts, in our lives to love our neighbors. This vision has been an answer to that call. And throughout this time together, from the very outset, um, to where we stand one year later, what is clear to me is that God has been with us, present with us, faithful to us throughout this entire process. His, 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 the reality that he is in this and that he is, is leading us and guide us has been um, powerfully evident um, throughout the entire story of, of Chapel Street Church and the Mill Creek campus. He's repeatedly validated to us who he is um, and that he goes before us. So today for us is a, a, an intentional moment to pause and to celebrate the God who continues to prove himself faithful. And we wanna remind ourselves of that. Additionally, the second thought that just keeps recurring for me is, is just a deep sense of gratitude, a deep sense of, of thankfulness, gratitude for the 150 plus men, women, and children who from the very outset said, you know what, we'll go with you. We'll, we'll be all in. People who said, we will serve with you and continue to do that. Many of you are sitting in this room right now. Thank you. Like, seriously, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. I knew I would do this. <laughs> I have a deep sense of gratitude for our Chapel Street Church family. Those who bought into this vision, those who committed to pray, those, those who gave so generously so that the Mill Creek campus could even be a reality. I, I, to this day, I can't walk into South Street or our Kesslinger campus and not have somebody there greet me and ask how things are going out at Mill Creek and reaffirm once again that, that they're with us and that they're praying for us, that they are are celebrating today just as we are and they have been there all along to to support us and and recognizing once again god's faithfulness in this process in this story it's it's funny to me how it's been the experience of launching a third campus that that for me specifically has validated more powerfully than ever before that we are in fact one church and god has shown himself in that once again and I can't, I can't adequately express um, to this Chapel Street Church family at South Street and Kesslinger, thank you for all you've done, all the support, all the prayer, all the generosity, thank you. I could go on and on and on for, for Chapel Street Church leadership, for, for listening to the leading of the Holy Spirit, being obedient in that, being willing to take the risks and say, you know what, we'll give this a shot and let's see how that goes, so thank you. For, for Pastor Jeff and Pastor Brian, who paved the way for this vision, who are willing to, to, um, to send in order to continue to reach. Thank you for, for our Chapel Street Church staff, the people who support and encourage and walk alongside. I am just so thankful. God, God is so good. And, and I have experienced and seen that goodness so powerfully in the people that he has, has put around us, this, this church family that God has given us. And so my, my heart and my prayer is that our collective sense of gratitude this morning would just be this 
incredible expression of praise to the God who has made all of this possible. And, and the reality is, is that there are greater things that he desires to do. The neighborhood church vision, when you think about it, we are still in our infancy. We're, we're still just sort of getting into this. There are more stories to be told. We, we couldn't begin to capture all the stories to share in that video. And there's so many more to be written. There are more lives that God desires to impact, and there are more neighborhoods that he wants to transform. And so we are looking forward and, and preparing for what's next, and there will be so much more to celebrate because there are greater things yet to come. So let's, let's pray real quick this morning, and we'll look at uh, the text for the day. Father, it is just a, a humbling sense this morning just to be here in this community with these people, recognizing that you had a vision for us that was beyond what we had, um, had previously understood, and you sent us to make an impact in, in a neighborhood and with our neighbors. So God, I pray that you would continue to etch that story in our hearts and our minds, or that you would continue to expand the vision. And Jesus, that we would follow you in obedience. God, we celebrate your faithfulness to us. Continue to meet us in this place. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Today we are going to continue our, our fall teaching series entitled With Jesus where we have been asking ourselves the question, what does it mean to do life with Jesus? Where, where Jesus is at the core of, of who we are and what we do and how we live. Where we as a, as a body and as individuals are actively engaged in his kingdom business. Where we submit to his rule and reign as, as king of our lives. What does it look like for you and I to live as an apprentice of Jesus? Previously, we've, we've been looking at these conversations that took place over a, a shared meal, and we talked about the significance of that in that culture where, where Jesus is validating and inviting people into relationship, and we talked about what does that look like for us to experience that and to, to invite other people to meet Jesus, to be at the table with Jesus, to find their identity in him. Last week, we, we kind of began a subset of this series entitled Wrestling with Jesus, where these questions that, that are posed of him, issues that people want clarity on or debates that they sort of want to challenge Jesus on. So Pastor Jeff and Pastor Brian last week talked about wrestling with Jesus about, about the kingdom. And what does it mean to live in God's kingdom and to submit to him as king of our lives? And this week we're talking about wrestling with Jesus about morality or wrestling with Jesus in the next couple of weeks about politics and money and sex. And so many of these questions that, that were asked of Jesus some 2,000 years ago tend to be some of the fundamental and essential questions that, that we wrestle with to this day. I don't know if you heard about this. I, I just became aware about this uh, this week, and I heard somebody else tell this story. But um, last year, during the Venice Marathon, the runners were running, and, and I don't know about this from experience, but I read it on the internet. And these, I guess the way the marathon works is that there's a pacer or a guide that's showing you the route. There's somebody out on a motorcycle that, that's kind of in front of the lead runners. And at the Venice Marathon, because it's such an ancient city, there's certain sections of the route, the marathon route, that the, the motorcycle can't, can't go. And so it intentionally veers off in a different direction, and the runners head through this, the portion of the race that the motorcycle can't lead them on. Well, what ultimately happened was that when the, the motorcycle veered off, the lead runners didn't realize that the route went a different direction. So they continued to follow the motorcycle. And all of these top-notch world runners ran um, hundreds of meters off course. Far enough off course, in fact, that for the first time in 22 years, a local Italian won the Venice Marathon because everybody else went, went a wrong direction. So this is how we used to think about, about morality, or really, I, I could say, how we worried about morality. 
that someone at the front would lead us in the wrong direction, that, that they would take us down the wrong path. In fact, that's how people throughout uh, history have sort of understood what it means to be moral and immoral. For the, the vast majority of human history, a culture has an adopted sort of understanding, a collective sense of how you make those judgments, how you assess that. And yet in Western cultures, over the last few generations, that's increase, increasingly less true. So the question that we wrestle with isn't just a matter of, is the person who we are looking to going to lead us in the right direction? Are they taking us in the right path? But more so, which, which person do we look to? Using the, the marathon equivalent, it would be that there was motorcycle guides heading every which direction all around us, and, and you're not only wondering or hoping that that person's leading you in the right direction, you're trying to choose which one to follow. So there's people who, who claim moral authority and are giving moral as moral guides in our lives, and yet they're heading in every different direction simultaneously, and it can leave us somewhat dizzy and confused and disoriented as we look around us and we wonder, okay, where do, where do we start? Like, where do we look to understand what it means to be moral or immoral? And, and this gets at the heart of the question that Jesus is asked. Let's turn to Mark chapter 12, the gospel of Mark. We're going to pick things up midway through, through the chapter here in verse... Uh, 28, where Jesus is asked an important question. It says, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. And noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and all your mind, and all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one, and there are no other but him. To love him with all your heart, and all your understanding, and all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Let's begin by, by first looking at a relevant question here. A relevant question that, that's inherent in the text. I am um, one of the, the calls that we sometimes get as, as a pastor is to enter into situations or into people's lives when, when things are at their worst. Um, and sometimes when, when they're at their worst, it really is a situation when they're facing their own, their own death. And I had one such call just, just a couple weeks ago where um, this woman was realizing that her time here on earth was, was coming to a close. And what she was wrestling with in that moment was the very same question that's being asked of here in this text. Essentially, she wanted to know, is God going to find me acceptable? It, have I been good enough? She had apparently had a conversation with somebody and, and, and sort of caused her to doubt so much of what was core in her her faith, and so in, in the midst of all of this fear and anxiety with what she was facing, she wanted to know, is, has it been enough? Is, is God ultimately going to find me acceptable? And I had the opportunity in that moment to sit by her hospital bed and, and to remind her of the heart of the gospel and to say, you, you, you haven't been good enough. We, you haven't done enough. You aren't acceptable enough. He is. Jesus is, and you accept that by faith when you place your trust in him for the forgiveness of sins. It's not how much we went to church or how much good we've been able to do. It's what he's done in, in your decision to take on his, his righteousness, his perfection. And you can see in that moment this, this clarity for her, this, this weight almost lifted off her shoulders, 
has all this fear and anxiety because she knew that. She had just begun to, to doubt it. She needed to be reminded. She needed to be reaffirmed of what the gospel teaches us. To be reminded of what Jesus had accomplished for her. See here, this teacher of the law is, is asking a relevant question. It's a question that, that all of us at some point in time in our lives ask in one way or another. And in fact, it's not the first time that, that someone has come to Jesus with a very similar question. In Mark chapter 10, just a few chapters earlier, there is a, a man who runs up to Jesus and falls on his knees and says to him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? See, these are very similar questions that emerge from very similar concerns. They're coming from the same place. What, what do I ultimately need to do to be found acceptable before God? Or in other words, how good is good enough? This is the essence of their questions. And, and one of the things I appreciate about this teacher of the law here in Mark chapter 12 is, is the honesty that, that is evident. Just previous to his question here to Jesus, this teacher of the law has been watching Jesus in this conversation, or as it says early on, the, the, this debate that he's been having with the Sadducees. And the Sadducees were sort of a, a religious political group, and they were challenging Jesus on doctrines relating to the resurrection and the afterlife, two, two beliefs that the Sadducees denied. And so when Jesus confronts their questions and he answers those for him, the Pharisee is listening to this and he's hearing it all, and, and he's agreeing with Jesus. He, he would be in alignment with how Jesus answers the Pharisees on their questions. And so he decides to go to Jesus in order to have him elaborate on the questions that's bothering him, essentially, what is the most important commandment? He wants Jesus to, to boil it down. He, he wants him to get at what, what is it that he really needs to know. Do you remember the first time you were asked, or maybe the first time you asked one of your kids to babysit? I, I can remember the very first time we left our oldest in charge of our younger two kids. And you're leaving the house and you want to give them a few instructions and you're kind of like, hey, make sure you guys just don't watch TV all night or, or make sure the kitchen gets cleaned up after dinner and make sure that everybody's homework is done and you're giving them all of these instructions. But, but as you really are walking out the door, you, I look at my oldest and say, like, just have everybody alive when we get home, <laughs> right? Like when you... It, 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 we're going to call it a win if we come home and everybody's okay and the house is still standing. And you, you want to get at the core of what it looks like. The essence is this is, what the, this is what this man is driving at with Jesus. As this teacher of this law, this Pharisee, he would have been aware of that the, the, the fact that the Old Testament contains 613 distinguishable commands or laws. And so his question here, this honest question, implies the fact that he understands that this is a burden too heavy for him to carry. That it is impossible for him to meet this standard all the time. In fact, I think he understands that it's impossible for anyone to carry or to meet that standard. So the essence of, of what he wants to know here, what he wants to get at the core of, is, is what does it look like to follow God? What does it look like for me to be good enough. And Jesus answers his question. In doing so, he, he, he not only gets at the heart of what he's asking, but he really ultimately redefines his understanding of what it means to be moral. And this is where we discover a paradigm shift. A paradigm shift. I, uh, um, I have three daughters, and... Occasionally, I will, I'll attempt to help them do their homework. My two oldest are in high school now, so I really am of no help there. Um, but my youngest is in fifth grade, and, and so I'll sit down with her from time to time and, and try to help her do her homework. And I don't know if you've tried to help uh, an elementary age kid do math lately, um, but that is a whole different experience. Um, I, she was working this week on multiplying decimals. 
And I thought, okay, I know how to do that. And, and I started to write it out for her. I wrote out the multiplication problem. I removed the decimal point, And I thought, okay, this is how we do it. And she said, Dad, that's not how you do it. I said, I, this is definitely how you do it. And she started drawing out these boxes and putting things every, and they're, they're tenths and they're once and they're all these different places. And she put the number that she was multiplying by on the outside of the box and she started drawing this out and adding stuff together. And I thought, what are you doing? Like, and at the end of the day, she got the answer right. And she said, dad, this is how you do math now. I was like, well, I didn't know that that was changing, but apparently it is. Like there's this whole new way that she has of understanding what it means to multiply decibels that was completely foreign to me. An entire paradigm shift. Look again at how Jesus responds to the question here. This is back in verse 29 and 30. So just previous to this, the, the, the teacher of the law says, of all the commandments, which is the most important? And Jesus answers, the most important one is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. See, the teacher of the law here is most likely expecting or he's hoping that Jesus is going to be more specific. His, his expectation or his desire, according to most commentators, is that Jesus is going to identify one or perhaps a group of the Ten Commandments and say, this is, what, this is the area that you really need to get right. But Jesus doesn't do that. He, he completely reorients his understanding of what it means to be moral. See, typically when we think about this topic or we debate about it or we argue about it, we, we kind of take two platforms, one about what, is, what we view as primary and what we view as secondary. Some of us would look at this conversation and we would argue that it's really important when you understand what it means to be moral, what's important is what you do. It's how you act. Or if you were to put it in the language of this teacher of the law, it's, it's about the law. So about living in alignment with the law. As long as you do the right thing, it's not so important what motivates that. Other people, however, would argue is that what is primary, rather, is the motivation. The action is important, but, but what really is, is fundamentally drives whether something is moral or immoral is what's motivating that. If it's coming from the right place, so if it's done out of love, then, then the action is, is almost secondary to that. In fact, if... If you just listening to those two descriptions, I would venture to guess that for most of you, there's one of those two options that we more intuitively lean to, that feels more correct to us. I know there is for me, just writing this out, I knew there was one of those two things that, that more intuitively I thought, yeah, okay, I think it's that way. But Jesus is deconstructing their understanding and now expanding it, their understanding of what it means to be moral. He says that the highest moral imperative according to jesus is to love god with everything we have every part of our being and so jesus now quotes from their rich history is israel's rich history he quotes the shema in deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 and 5 he says hear o israel the lord our god the lord is one love the lord your god with all your heart and all your soul with all your mind and with all your strength and the teacher of the law would have understood this. This would have been intuitive to him, something he had memorized and known from childhood and probably recited every single day of his life. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, and love your neighbor as yourself. He, Jesus is quoting here from Leviticus chapter 19. He, he's quoting from the, the center of the Levitical Law And Jesus now is saying that these things are intrinsically linked, that they can't be separated. Saying the highest moral imperative is to love God with our entire selves, but then to also demonstrate that love by living in alignment with his character, in alignment with the God who has been revealed to us 
in the person of Jesus Christ and through his written word, he defines for us what it looks like, what it means to be loving. So, so what Jesus is saying here on the one hand is, is we can be lawful, we can do all the right things, and yet if that's coming from a place of, of um, promoting self, if, if the motivation out of that is not love for God and who he is, then what we're doing is, is, is merely spiritual pride and self-righteousness. It, it's about building some kind of spiritual resume so that we feel like we stack up better than the people around us. And Jesus saying to act lawfully without the motivation of love isn't lawful. But then he also says to be loving outside of God's character and his commands isn't love. See, he, he, he takes what it means to be moral and he completely shifts the way they understood and thought about the answer to that question. He completely shifts how they understood and answered the question, what does it mean to be good enough? See, the law, according to Jesus, when rightly understood, is an act of love. In fact, all of it is, is, is an expression of God's love and care for his people and how we then love and care for each other. And so he's, he's rooting it in something greater. He's rooting it in this, this love relationship with him that then works itself out to the relationships around us. Um, one of the questions that, that we frequently get asked in ministry, particularly in student ministry, I know this is, has been the case, and I know Tom and Gretchen and Andrew deal with questions like this all the time. Somebody will come up to you, a student will come up and say, is such and such a sin? Is, is, they'll just, whatever, that, whatever the issue of the day is, whatever they're talking about, they'll come and want clarity about, is this a, a sin? And I was, um, one, one example of that was every time we would teach on or talk about dating relationships and all of that, and I would oftentimes do a, a segment where we would do question and answers, and we wanted to deal with what was most important to them, and, and it would inevitably be somebody that asked the question, how far is too far? Like, what, what, what is the line? Give me the line of where I can go and, and what it means to, what I can do physically with, with my girlfriend or my boyfriend and, and all this sort of thing, that question would inevitably come up. And I was reading this article um, just last week that Pastor Brian sent me. It's uh, written by Andy Stanley. He was talking about how to answer that question. And, and really, he was um, making the argument that we're asking the wrong question. This question that we say is, is blank, whatever, the, whatever it is, a sin. Really, the question that we need to ask as the church and as followers of Jesus is, what does love require of me? What, what does love require of me, and how do I know what it means to be loving in any situation? How do we answer that question? See, what Jesus is arguing is the, that, that the answer to the question of what love requires of us is, is by knowing the God who is love and the God who created us to love. And how do we grow in our capacity to, to love others, to do what love requires of us? We grow in that by growing deeper and deeper in love with him. You see, he is the standard of love. He's the definition of it. And he created you and I to be in a love relationship with him. And so there's an order and a priority here. As we grow more and more in love with him and as he defines for us what that looks like by his character and his person and by what he's given us in his word, that we live that out to the people around us. Meaning that you and I don't get to define in our own terms what it means to be loving. He has defined that for us. And he says this is the greatest command. I'll wrap up with this. If you turn back to Mark chapter 12, I just want to note real quickly the response that takes place here. This is verse 32 through 34. He says, well said, teacher, the man replied. You're right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. 
And when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. See, the, the teacher of the law is, is getting it. He's understanding what, what God requires of him. He's recognizing the heart of God is designed for us to love him and to love each other. And so Jesus affirms him in his answer. But what sticks out to me here in this passage is this, this conclusion in that last verse. It's just this stunned silence. It says, from then on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Why is that their response? Why does this answer from Jesus shut down the conversation? See, I think it's because that those who are a part of this debate, this argument, this conversation, recognize that the standard of the greatest command, the definition of what it means to be moral, is beyond their reach. I, I think it's because they understand that to love God perfectly and to love others perfectly all the time is beyond their capacity. And yet this is the definition that Jesus just gave. And will never measure up which is exactly his point. See, this whole conversation that Jesus has been having here is taking place in the temple. And Jesus here, and although they don't understand this at this time, they don't fully see this, Jesus here is pointing them forward to what he will accomplish on the cross. Jesus has already told his disciples that, that the temple would be destroyed and that he would raise it again in three days, referring to his own death and resurrection. Because Jesus would be the one, the only one who would perfectly meet this standard. Perfect love lived in perfect obedience. See, the reality is, is that, that we aren't good enough. We aren't moral enough. We, we, we aren't acceptable in the presence of a holy God, but he is. And by faith, through the forgiveness of sins, by his grace, Jesus' perfection can be laid over us. It can be imputed to us by his sacrifice so that we can live in this love relationship with, with him. And the greater, the deeper that we go in that relationship with him, the more then that we can live that out to the people around us in this community, outside of these walls and, and in our world. This is the vision of what we believe God has called us to as a neighborhood church. This is the vision of, of why we think he sent us out here. And in order to do that, we need to grow more and more deeper and deeper in love with him so that we can be more and more effective in loving the people that God puts around us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to gather in this place to be present here. God, we recognize that, that in and of ourselves, we don't have what it takes, but you lived perfect love and perfect obedience. And then you paid the sacrifice for our sins so that we could be found in you. Lord, grow us more and more in love with who you are and what you've done so that we can be more and more effective at loving the people that you've put around us. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. This morning, as we conclude our service time together, we are going to um, respond with communion. Um, again, just as a, as a reminder, um, communion at Chapel Street Church is, is you don't have to be a member here. You don't have to, you, this could be your very first Sunday. If you are in a relationship with Jesus, if you have accepted him as your savior, you're welcome to take communion. Um, our ushers will pass this out in just a moment. You can take both cups and hold on to those. And then I will come up and guide us through the taking of the bread and of the cup. Let's pray together. Father, as we heard from your word this morning, Lord, you are the very definition of love. And God, in your wisdom and in your love for us, you gave us a means to be reminded of that. And Lord, you said, you told us, do this in remembrance of me. So Lord, remind us again this morning of how much you love us so that we might grow deeper in love with you. And we ask these things in your name. Amen.